video is brought to you by Dr. Borai. Please press on the subscribe button and the bell icon. Hello everyone, this is Avijit Borai. In this video, I'm going to uh, show you some interesting ECG with regards to the heart blocks. In this particular video, I'm going to uh, show you uh, first degree atrioventricular block or first degree heart block. And in subsequent other videos, I will show you second degree and third degree heart block. I'll show you how to differentiate between these different types of heart blocks. And I hope that you find it useful. So with me, I have got uh, Becky, who has got some really exceptional knowledge and skills in interpretation of the ECGs. And uh, she's going to help me in preparing uh, this presentation. All right, uh, Becky, thank you. Uh, nice to see you here. Hello, everyone. I am Becky. As always, I am very excited to be here. Over the next few minutes, we are going to show you some awesome ECGs with a lot of animations and up-to-date information. Hope you like it. I know how amazing you are. Please press on the subscribe button below and do not forget to click on the bell icon to get regular updates. We will bring to you new exciting videos regularly for your education and entertainment. If you have any burning questions or awesome ideas, please write in the comments section below and we will get back to you as soon as we can. I can assure you that the next few minutes will be brilliant. I will be with you till the end of the video. Let's start, shall we? Yes, uh, that's a great introduction, uh, Becky. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, at first, uh, let me uh, show you one uh, ECG and then we'll uh, show you how to interpret it. So this was a 58-year-old gentleman who presented to the emergency department with some discomfort, feeling generally unwell. So routinely we did one ECG and this is what we have found. Um, Becky is going to uh, interpret this ECG in a few minutes, uh, but uh, I will be very honest with you. If you are familiar with ECG, you know that the uh, main problem, which is very obvious here, is the uh, prolonged PR interval. It is sinus rhythm, and uh, we'll talk about it in, in a second. So let's uh, go to the background. So what is uh, a first degree atrioventricular block? A first degree atrioventricular block is a condition when uh, the PR interval, that is from the beginning of P wave to the beginning of QRS complex, that is more than 200 milliseconds, or you can say it is more than five smaller squares or one larger square. There are certain situations where the PR interval is really big, so more than 300 milliseconds. And if that is the case, then probably this is, uh, the problem is in the atrioventricular node. And as you can realize that the first degree atrioventricular block does not necessarily needs to be in the atrioventric atrioventricular node. The first degree heart block can be in the atria. It can be in the level of the bundle of his. It can even be at the right on uh, left bundle uh, branches. So that's why I prefer to use the term first degree heart block rather than atrioventricular block, because not all the time the heart block is an atrioventricular block. The problem may be somewhere else. Now, another important uh, diagnostic criteria for the first degree heart block is that there will be no atrioventricular interruption. What I mean is that all the atrial impulses will go to the ventricles. There is no atrioventricular dissociation. If there is atrioventricular dissociation, then that will be a completely different thing. So that will be a, a, a complete heart block. All right. Now, uh, before we get into the formal inter interpretation of the first degree atrioventricular block, let, let's uh, recap some information about the ECG. So as you can realize that the, in the heart, there is some electrical activity, and we can pick up that by putting some electrodes in various parts of the body and in a machine that can amplify it and get a graphical representation, and that is the ECG or EKG in the US, they call it. Now, the lead and the electrode, they are not the same thing. That, that sticky bits, which are connected to the body, in the arms, in the chest, in the shoulder, that is the electrode, not the lead. The lead is when the computer interprets a, a special viewpoint, then that is the lead. For example, if I say lead AVF, it means what is happening in the undersurface of the heart. If I say lead one, I say, I mean, what is happening to the left surface of the heart? So not necessarily that you will have 12 electrodes in your body, but you can have 12 leads because these 12 electrodes, the information from them can be interpreted by the computer and give you a 12 different viewpoints. And that is the um, lead. Now, 
Uh, conventionally, there are 12 leads. I'm sorry about the uh, misspelling here. Um, so usually there are six uh, limb leads and six chest leads, but you can have more leads. For example, if you want to see what, exactly what is happening to the right sur surface of the heart, you can do V4R. If you want to see what is happening at the back of the heart, then you can do V7, V8, and V9. Similarly, if you want to see what is happening to the atria, you can do Lewis leads. Now, I have got some different videos on those topics and we'll talk about it in a different time. So let's uh, focus on the first degree active ventricular block. Another important thing is whenever you look at this EG, please go through this in a systematic way because first degree active ventricular block is one of those things which can be easily missed. It's not a big deal because most of the time it is a benign condition, but still it's quite embarrassing that if you miss a first degree active ventricular block and if your uh, junior colleague tells you, oh, that patient has got a first degree active ventricular block, you might not be a very happy person, are you? So let me uh, quickly recap again, what are the different steps that you need to uh, take to have a systematic uh, analysis of the ECG? The first thing you need to look at is the rate. Look at the atrial rate and look at the ventricular rate. They may not be the same. Most of the time in sinus rhythm, you will see that uh, the atrial rate and ventricular rate, they will be fine. Usually it will take a few seconds to count the rate. And after you're happy with the rate, then look at the rhythm. Is it sinus rhythm? Is it uh, irregular, irregular? Is there something else going on? Is there any pacing rhythm? Then you look at the axis. Most of the time we look at the axis of the QRS complexes, but you can look at the axis of the P wave as well, if you like. And once you are happy with that, then look at the PR interval. Look at the P wave, identify the P wave from the beginning of P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex, that is the PR interval. Please don't get confused between PR interval and PR segment. The PR segment is from the end of P wave to the beginning of a QRS complex. Uh, the PR segment is important in case of the diagnosis of uh, pericarditis. So look at the P wave and look at the PR interval and the PR segment. They are different. A gold mine in the ECG, of course, is the QRS complex. Is it narrow complex? Is it white complex? Is it regular? Is it irregular? Is it regularly regular? Is it irregularly irregular? Is it regularly regular? There are different varieties of it. We'll talk about it in another video. Of course, uh, you need to look at the ST segment. Is it isoelectric? Is it elevated? Is it depressed? Do we need to activate the cath lab because there is ST elevation? Or do we need to treat the patient for myocardial ischemia, but not STEMI yet? Then you look at the QTC, which is from the beginning of the QRS complex to the uh, end of the T wave. And you need to correct it according to the ventricular rate. Um, most people forget to look at the AVR and some other fine prints like the poor R wave progression in V3. Please look at it. You will be surprised that so many valuable information will be there. And when you look at all these things, then finally you, you combine them together, you compile all the information and get an interpretation. Correlate this with the patient's condition, correlate with the patient and and find out some management options. So once again, whenever you look at this, please look, go through rate, rhythm, axis, peer interval and peer segment, QRS complex, ST segment, QTC, AVR, and other fine prints. And that is uh, that is exactly how uh, Becky is going to uh, interpret this CG as well. Awesome. Really interesting. I know. Right. So let's uh, show you some animations so that we can have a very good understanding about the conduction system of the heart. So uh, this is the right atrium here, tricuspid valve. This is the right ventricle. This is the interventricular septum. This is the left atrium here, the left ventricle here, and this is the uh, ascending aorta. This is the atrial valve. Sorry, this is the aortic valve. This is the uh, mitral valve, and this is the tricuspid valve. Now, what you can see in the yellow color, this is a conduction system. So the SA node, which is the pacemaker, it generates a cardiac impulse, and then through the three interatrial pathways, this cardiac impulse is transmitted to the AV node, where there is a little delay because of the refractory period. Then the cardiac impulse goes to the atrioventricular node, then to the right bundle branch and left bundle branch, Purkinje fibers, and to the myocardial fibers. That is how the normal cardiac impulse occurs. So let's uh, see what happens exactly. Uh, as you can see, that cardiac impulse is uh, transmitted uh, throughout the uh, heart, but it is generated in the SA node at the first rate. 
So Becky, could you please uh, tell us a little bit about the cardiac conduction system? This is the normal conduction system. If we understand the normal conduction system of the heart, that would be easier for us to understand the first degree atrioventricular block or first degree heart block as well. Thank you, Becky. This is the normal cardiac activity. The SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. It generates cardiac impulse at the normal rate of 60 to 90 beats per minute. True. Thank you. The cardiac impulse then passes through the interatrial pathways to the AV node where there is some delay. You can appreciate it here. In the ECG, there is a PR interval due to the AV nodal delay. This is followed by the conduction of cardiac impulse through the bundle of his into the right and left bundles and Purkinje fibers and cardiac myocytes. In the ECG, the P wave represents the atrial depolarization. The PR interval is the AV nodal delay, the QRS complex is the ventricular depolarization and the T wave is the ventricular repolarization. This goes on and on and on. So, the normal ECG is very easy to comprehend. One thing needs to be remembered is that the positive deflection of the ECG means that the cardiac impulse is passing towards the lead. On the other hand, a negative deflection means that the cardiac impulse is passing away from the particular lead. Excellent stuff, isn't it? It's really good. Thank you very much. Um, so that is the normal um, conduction system. This is a normal heart, normal sinus rhythm. There is no first degree atrioventricular block in this particular uh, patient. So let's see what happens in the first degree atrioventricular block. Please uh, keep an eye on the PR interval here. So from the beginning of PU, P wave to the beginning of QRS complex, that is the PR interval. So we'll um, see what happens in the first degree atrioventricular block. So this is the another patient, similar. So that is this SA node, which is the pacemaker, and uh, the SA node is uh, generating the cardiac impulse. Now, if you carefully look at it, there is a longer delay in the AV node. And as a consequence, the PR interval from the beginning of PA to the beginning of QRS complex, that becomes prolonged. And the moment it crosses the, um, the threshold of 200 milliseconds, we call it a first degree atrioventricular block. Um, so should we be worried about it? Yes, um, they usually it is a benign condition and we usually don't need to worry about it. Now, a few things I need to mention here is that, as I mentioned earlier, that many people say this is the first degree atrioventricular block, but be very careful because this does not necessarily, the problem is, this does not necessarily mean that the problem is in the atrioventricular node. The problem may be somewhere here. If there is a myocardial fibrosis or myocardial ischemia, or the problem may be in the bundle of his, if there is a myocardial fibrosis, sarcoidosis, or some electrolyte abnormality that can affect this area. So the problem may be in the atria, the problem may be in the atrioventricular node, which is the commonest site, the problem may be in the bundle of his, the problem may be in the uh, right and left bundle. Uh, so it's a misnomer to call it an atrioventricular block. It's not an atrioventricular block, it is a hard block, which can be most commonly in the atrioventricular node, but it can be anywhere else. So we need to be very careful about uh, the nomenclature when we call it an atrioventricular block. Personally, I don't like to call it atrioventricular block. I prefer to call it a hard block, first degree hard block. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. So, um, Becky, I'm going to show you some ECGs and giving you some information about this patient. Please um, interpret those ECGs in a systematic way. So this was uh, the same patient that I have shown you earlier, a 58-year-old gentleman who is coming to the emergency department, feeling not generally very well. And we did the ECG, and this is what we have found. So could you please uh, interpret this ECG uh, for us uh, so that we can all understand exactly what is going on? Thank you. It is a great ECG, Avijit. Thank you. I am going to interpret this ECG in a very systematic way. However, if there is an elephant in the room, that does not need an introduction. The elephant in the room in this ECG is a very prolonged PR interval. We you. can call it a first degree AV block. Thank I will you. come back to it in a second, Avijit. Let me talk you through the usual stuff at first. The ventricular rate is 90 beats per minute. Every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. Therefore, the rhythm is a sinus rhythm. Yeah. Now, the axis of the QRS complexes is about plus 60 degree which is normal. The P wave is normal and the PR interval is about 300 milliseconds. 
The QRS complexes are narrow complex and regular. The ST segments are isoelectric. The T waves are normal. The QTC is about 360 milliseconds which is normal. The AVR lead looks reassuring to me. Now to compile all these information together, I am of the impression that the patient has a first degree AV block. I am not particularly concerned about this patient. My immediate action would be to seek and treat the underlying cause. For example, if the patient is on a beta blocker, that may be the culprit. This is a bread and butter ECG for every emergency medicine doctor. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Vicky. That was a very comprehensive um, systematic uh, analysis of the ECG. I mean, it's a very simple thing in this ECG, which is just a first degree block. But if you go through the ECG every time in a very systematic way, you will not miss it. Now, a couple of things, Becky, that I would like to add here is, um, let me uh, show you the PR, uh, PR uh, interval. So from the beginning of the P wave to the uh, beginning of the QRS complex, that is the PR interval. And uh, you, have, you are absolutely spot on that uh, this is about how many? probably eight uh, smaller squares, which is 320, uh, roughly. Um, sorry, uh, it is, um, sorry, it is about eight, so 320, yeah. So it is, it is pretty prolonged, I mean, and as I mentioned earlier, that if the PR interval is more than 300 milliseconds, probably the problem in the AV node, it is not in the bundle of his or bundle, right bundle, the bundle, or it is not in the atria, it is in the AV node where the problem is. Now, a couple of things I would like to show you here, uh, first of all, look at the AVL. In the AVL, um, the axis that you have said, that is normal axis between minus 30 and 90, that is, I completely agree with you. But for some reason, the QRS complex is negative deflection, which, which to me, it looks like it is almost like right uh, axis deviation. But again, in right axis deviation, in lead one, there will be negative deflection, which is not the case. So I think I agree with that. Now, what uh, bothers me is, if you carefully look at the V4, now look at the TP segment, which is here, and the PR segment, which is here. So there is a bit of elevation of the TP segment, not the ST segment, I'm talking about the TP segment. So the, the PR segment and the TP segment, they are not at the same level. Something is going on, and I don't know why. I don't have the full details about this question, so I don't know. But this is something, um, something weird, uh, which we need to, we need to uh, look into, especially when we uh, interpret this ECG. All right, that's great. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, no worries. Uh, so let's uh, do another ECG, uh, Becky. So this is another uh, patient. This is a 52-year-old uh, lady who presented to the MRC department. Uh, again, not feeling very well. So we did one ECG, and this is the 12 lead ECG. They have got uh, three limb leads and three chest leads. Um, so let's uh, interpret this ECG in a systematic way, and then we'll try to find out if there is anything wrong. Uh, go for it. Thank you. I am going to interpret this ECG in a very systematic way. The elephant in the room in this ECG is a very prolonged PR interval or a first degree AV block. Yeah. I will come back to it in a second, Avijit. No worries. Let me talk you through the usual stuff at first. Yes, please. The ventricular rate is 60 beats per minute, which is much slower than the previous ECG. Yeah. Every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. Yeah. Therefore, the rhythm is a sinus rhythm. Mm -hmm. Now, the axis of the QRS complexes is about plus 40 degrees, which is normal. Okay. The P wave is normal and the PR interval is about 360 milliseconds. The QRS complexes are narrow complex and regular. Yeah. The ST segments are isoelectric. Mm -hmm. The T waves are normal. In the lead V2, there is a positive wave after the T wave, which may be a U wave. Well spotted. How is the potassium of this patient, please? Hypokalemia is a possible cause of the U wave. However, it may be due to other conditions such as hyperthermia, myocardial ischemia, etc. The QTC is about 360 milliseconds, which is normal. The AVR lead looks reassuring to me. Yep. Now to compile all these information together, I am of the impression that the patient has a first degree AV block. Okay. I am not particularly concerned about this patient. My immediate action would be to seek and treat the underlying cause. For example, if the patient is on non-dehydropyridine group of calcium channel blockers such as verapamil or dilshazam, that may be the culprit. 
This is similar to the previous CCG. Excellent. So that was, again, very comprehensive, very thorough um, analysis of the ECG. Um, I think you are right that there is some, looks like there may be a positive deflection after the T wave. So there may be hypokalemia. Unfortunately, I don't have the uh, electrolyte result with me, so I don't know exactly what the potassium is. But yeah, that is something worth looking at. Well spotted. Uh, thank you, Becky. Let's do another ECG. So obviously, the, the main issue in this uh, particular patient is the prolonged PR interval. And um, as you can see, from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of QRS complex, yeah, that is well above uh, the threshold of 200 milliseconds. So I'll call it first degree after ventricular block. I completely agree with you. All right, so let's do another one. Now, um, this is uh, another patient who is 72 year old, coming with feeling very unwell, very dizzy. So we have done the, this ECG, and um, this is what we have found. Uh, so Becky, please uh, interpret this ECG for us um, and enlighten us with your knowledge about these ECGs. Thank you. This looks like an interesting ECG to me. Thank you, Avijith. Now, I am going to interpret this ECG in a very systematic way just like I did in the previous two ECGs. Yes, please. The elephant in the room in this ECG is a very prolonged PR interval. I will okay, come back you. to it in a second. Mm -hmm. Let me talk you through the usual stuff at first. Okay. The ventricular rate is 66 beats per minute which is comparable to the previous ECG. Yeah. In this ECG, every P wave is followed by a QRS complex. Yeah. Therefore, the rhythm is a sinus rhythm. Yeah. Now, the axis of the QRS complexes is left axis deviation. Yeah. The P wave is normal and the PR interval is about 480 milliseconds, which is huge. Huge. The QRS okay. complexes are narrow complex and regular. The ST segments are isoelectric. The T waves are normal. In the lead V3, there is a poor R wave progression which may be concerning. For example, myocardial ischemia can cause this finding. The QTC is about 480 milliseconds, which is normal. The AVR lead looks reassuring to me. Now, to compile all these information together, I am of the impression that the patient has a first degree AV block. My immediate action would be to seek and treat the underlying cause. For example, the patient may need some workup for myocardial ischemia. I would be interested to know what was the outcome of the patient. Yeah, so I think, again, that was an excellent comprehensive uh, ECG analysis. I really liked your approach. Um, now, a couple of things. Uh, I think you have spotted that very well, that uh, in V3, there is a poor R-wave progression, and sometimes it can be because of the myocardial ischemia. But another thing is, if you look at the AVL, the R-wave that is about, I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, more than 10, more than 11 uh, millimeter. That is a voltage criteria for the left ventricular hypertrophy. I can't, usually in case of left ventricular hypertrophy, they can have left axis deviation, and this patient has got left axis deviation. Now, I don't know exactly why the patient has got first to get ventricular block, but I completely agree with you. This is huge. This is massive. This is phenomenal. And it is so huge that sometimes we, we, we just we can miss it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, that if the PR interval is more than 300 milliseconds, probably the problem is in the AV node, not in the atria bundle of ease or right bundle or left bundle brass. So a couple of things here. So this is obviously there is first degree atrial ventricular block, no doubt over that, or first degree heart block. But what is also important is that there is a poor R wave progression in V3, and there is a voltage criteria for the left ventricular hypertrophy. Well spotted. Thank you very much. So again, uh, this is the uh, PR from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. And if we measure it, that will, that will be about 10, 11, 12, 13. So it is yeah about more than 480 milliseconds, which is used. Absolutely. It's massive. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. It is. OK. Now, this is just a rhythm strip, but um, I think it will, it would be worth looking at it. So, uh, Becky, could you please uh, go through this um, rhythm strip for us? Thank you. This is a rhythm strip. It is not a 12 lead ECG. There is not much information in the rhythm strip. 
Anyway, let me interpret this ECG rhythm strip in a very systematic way just like I did in the previous ECGs. The elephant in the room in this ECG rhythm strip is a very prolonged PR interval. Here, the ventricular rate is 75 beats per minute which is a little faster than the previous ECG. In this ECG, there is a happy marriage between the P and the QRS complex. Therefore, it is a sinus rhythm. Sadly, the axis of the QRS complexes is not detectable from a rhythm strip alone. The P wave is normal and the PR interval is about 480 milliseconds which is huge just like the previous ECG. The QRS complexes are narrow complex and regular. The ST segments are isoelectric. The T waves are normal. The QTC is about 320 milliseconds which is a little shorter than I was hoping for. Now, to compile all these information together, I am of the impression that the patient has a first degree AV block. My immediate action would be to get a 12 lead ECG to have a better idea about the patient's condition. Yeah, so uh, again, it's very tricky to uh, get to a diagnosis just from a rhythm strip, but as you are, you are, you are uh, absolutely correct in saying that uh, the elephant in the room is first degree atrial ventricular block. Um, so in this uh, ECG from the beginning of P wave, ooh, I think there is a bit of mistake here. So from beginning of P wave will be from here. So from the from from the beginning of P wave to the beginning of QRS complex, still it will be about um, about uh, almost 400 milliseconds, which is huge. Completely agree with you. Uh, and there is a little error, Becky. Uh, so when we uh, calculate the PR interval, it is from here to here, not not from the T wave. Anyway, so uh, whenever we look at uh, the uh, first degree atrial ventricular block, we try to find out why it is happening. Most of the time, this is benign. This is not a serious problem. In young, he young healthy, athletic uh, people, first degree atrial ventricular block can be found or first degree heart block can be found. This is a normal phenomenon. However, there are some pathological conditions. For example, if the patient is on some beta blocker, metoprolol, uh, labetolol, um, carbidolol, this type of uh, things, they can have first degree atrial ventricular block or first degree heart block. There are some calcium center blocker, not all of them. So there, there is some calcium center blocker like nifidipine, amlodipine. They do not have any effect on the heart. Their effect is on the periphery. The non dihedroparadine group of calcium center blockers like verapamil, diltiazem, they can cause first degree heart block. Dizoxin, a, a usual culprit for uh, first degree heart block. Um, and myocardial ischemia, myocardial infarction, they can cause uh, first degree heart block as well. If there is myocardial fibrosis for any reason, or if the patient has got some in, 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 um, infiltrative conditions like amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, they can have. Uh, first degree heart block as well. There are a lot of different types of electrolyte abnormalities such as hyperkalemia that can cause prolonged uh, PR interval and first degree heart block. If you carefully look at it to, to, to memorize it, I use the mnemonic DIMES, D-I-M-E-S. So drugs, ischemia, mechanical causes, electrolyte abnormalities, and structural causes. So these are the main causes that we can see for the uh, first degree atrioventricular block. Of course, there may be some rare thing that you can find once in a lifetime. I'm not going to talk about that here. Now the management. So as most of the time, the first degree atrial ventricular block or first degree heart block, that is benign condition. We don't have to do anything, especially if the patient is asymptomatic, just uh, don't uh, worry too much about it. However, there may be some other underlying conditions. Patient can have some electrolyte abnormality. In that case, we need to treat it. If the patient has got myocardial infarction or ischemia, we need to identify it, we need to treat it. And um, now in summary, uh, in case of the first degree atrial ventricular block, the, the key word, the magic word that we need to remember is the 200 millisecond. If the PR interval from beginning of P wave to the beginning of QRS complex is more than 200 millisecond, that is first degree atrial ventricular block or first degree heart block in that matter. And most of the time it is benign. Um, but our, as, a, as, a, as an emergency doctor or urgent care doctor, our goal will be to identify the cause of it and try to, uh, try to give the treatment if we need to give the treatment. Most of the time it is physiological and we don't have to do much. All right, uh, Vicky, could you please um, summarize uh, all this information for us and for the audience? Thank you. No worries. So, the first degree heart block is a condition where the PR interval is longer than 200 milliseconds. 
the problem may be in the AV node. That's why it is called first degree atrioventricular block. However, first degree heart block can happen due to the problems in other levels as well. For example, the problem may be at the atrial level, bundle of his level or even at the levels of the right or left bundle. The causes of the first degree heart block can be young athletes, drugs, myocardial ischemia, myocarditis, sarcoidosis, myocardial fibrosis or electrolyte disturbances. Usually, the first degree heart block is a relatively benign condition. Our aim is to identify the underlying cause and treat the cause. First degree heart block is easy to miss. We need to analyze the ECG in a very systematic way so that we do not miss the first degree heart block. Hope that helps. Absolutely. So that was a really very good summary, Vicky. Um, now, there are a lot of information about these various types of ECG. There are a lot of resources. Um, in uh, Life in the First Lane, they have got some ECGs which show first degree atrial ventricular block. I have got a huge collection of my own ECGs. Um, there are, so to get the latest information, you can also go through the article in UpToDate, um, which is, I think, updated just in October 2020. So that is pretty a recent article. So uh, if you want to have any further information, if you have got any questions, please uh, drop me a line and we'll be uh, able to give some information if that is within our capacity. Um, if you have got some different views, if you have got some debate, uh, please uh, get in touch. Thank you very much for uh, watching and uh, I'll see you soon. Okay, thank you, Becky, uh, for uh, helping uh, me with the uh, interpretation of this CG. That was really good, really thorough, really comprehensive. Um, I hope that everybody does the ECG interpretation exactly what you have done. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Becky. Okay, folks. Thank you for watching the video. Hope you have enjoyed the video. You are so awesome. If you find it useful, please like the video, subscribe to the channel and share it with others. Please write comments below the video. For every comment that you write, positive or negative, I will personally give a cookie to my cat Lucy. <laughs> I promise I will do. If you have any burning questions, constructive suggestions or some awesome ideas, please get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Your comments and suggestions are very important to us. You can contact us through email, Twitter or Dr. Barai's webpage. Thanks once again. See you soon. Bye for now. Thank you.